we're changing things up a bit. So this morning, um, us female music group are going to start us off with some worship, and then hopefully seamlessly that will transition into, into some other things. Um, we're all a little bit nervous because we've not done this for a long time, so bear with us. And we've not played together for 18 months or something like that, but hopefully it will go well. Um, the words will be on the screen, so sing along in your hearts, if not with your voices. <laughs>
gathered together once again in this building. And even though the building doesn't make the church, it's so lovely to be together again as a church family. So lovely to hear um, worship in some to you. And we can't wait for the day when we all get to join in singing, full, filling our lungs again once again with worship for you, Father. We pray that you will help to um, stir our hearts this morning. You will help us to be filled with your spirit, be filled with your word that Paul brings to us later. We pray that you will just help us to unite as one, even though we are spread socially distant, that you can bring us really together as a church family. We pray that we can spend time together in, um, in celebration this afternoon as we have lunch together um, in fellowship. And we pray that you will just help to really bond us together as a church family with a united mission of serving you, of worshipping you and glorifying you this morning. I'm going to do one more. You can sit down if you feel like you have to, but it's worth standing. <laughs> Oh, so 
add my welcome to everybody. It is so, so good to be here. It was really good to stand at the back watching you all. That was really good. Can I also say a special welcome to all those that are actually at home watching us this morning? Mark tells me that there are 15 screens on at home somewhere or other. So that means that there's a minimum of 15 people watching us as well at home, which is really, really good. So welcome to you and so glad that you could join with us as well. Now, I'm sure if I was to ask all of you, did you enjoy lockdown? What was the worst bit about it? You've all got different things to say, but I thought, well, I can't go around to ask all of you this morning, because if we haven't got time, we'd be here all day. But I thought it would be good just to get a, a flavour this morning of lockdown, just from one person. And I'm not going to spring it on anybody, it's right, they are prepared for this, so you're, you're okay. I'm going to ask Naomi to come up. And I've given Naomi a few questions, and hopefully she's uh, been able to think about it. But you, you come and stand in front of that while I've got this one. And um, I'm sure that, that what Naomi will say is, is very representative of what I hope a lot of people will also be saying and thinking and, and whatever. So it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what you think. But uh, I want to ask Naomi just a few questions. So first of all, obviously, the one that everybody that wants to know is, what was the best thing about lockdown? <laughs> describing what the best thing about something when you're restricted is. Um, but, um, and I would uh, perhaps say maybe not spending as much money on petrol and commuting and things like that, but um, quite honestly it was um, getting to know uh, certain people within the church a lot better. Um, I was really, really privileged that um, sort of early, early on, at the end of last year, um, some of you know have been bubbled at the Pritchards and that's been that's been really lovely. They they sort of they reached out to me and sort of said, you know, would you like to bubble with us? Which was really kind. They recognised that I was living on my own because uh, my landlady is actually living elsewhere at the moment. So I was just it's just me, myself and I in the house. So actually getting to know them better and bless them, you know, I don't know how hard it's been for them to get to know me better, but um, it's been really good to uh, to do that. And also um, walking with Jan. Um, I've been each week sort of walking with Jan um, and that's been that's been lovely because again we just we just got to know each other just be talking and sharing and yeah like that. Okay we've said the best. the best what was the worst? Worst definitely not being able to travel. <laughs> not being able to not travel. Being able to travel yeah. Well I think well, I think I would look upon that as quite a nice thing actually. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> yeah, 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 yeah 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 no problem at all. Okay so um Something that you've learnt from the experience of lockdown. How about that one? That's a more difficult one for that, you. That's definitely difficult. Um, I think I just I've learned actually. I'm really I'm actually really privileged. I'm really fortunate. You know, I, I don't work in, a, in an industry where um, it relies on football, so we could work remotely. I didn't have to go on furlough. I, you know, we, we could keep going. And I have a roof over my head. I never have the kind of worries or troubles or anxieties that a lot of other people have had uh, during the periods of lockdown. So it just, it really brought home to me. I knew I was blessed, but it brought home to me how blessed I was and how Good. God had planned for me. Good. So, okay, let, let's, let's make it a little bit more sort of closer to home. As a Christian, obviously we've all been in isolation and lockdown. How has it been for you? How has it been hard being in isolation or in lockdown as a Christian? Um, yeah, it, it has at times been difficult, it's been, I think, boring, you know, when you sort of like, it's the same thing, it's sort of day in, day out, you work from home and then, you know, it's the weekend and it's like, you have the excitement of it being the weekend and then you go, oh yeah, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, so, yeah, that's been pretty dull. But, um, again, it, I, I feel like actually I've been really blessed because, you know, I've had people who've looked out for me and, um, you know, and people who've sort of knocked on the door as well. So I know that people would have had visits from uh, um, Elaine and Ian, for example, and, uh, and, and from Nick as well. And also I had a visit from the Brodings when uh, Helen came round to just, uh, I was close to finishing my first reading through the Bible, 
and so she came to bring me a bookmark, and that was just really lovely to, to talk to her, um, you know, and just to have that. People just thinking about you, so actually it's not really Brilliant, bad. brilliant. Okay, so thinking again about your, your walk as, as a Christian and, 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 uh, and God, how, how do you think God has changed you during lockdown? Uh, he's just made me appreciate what I've got more, and, and also the, the kindness that's been sort of shown to me. Is, I'm, I'm not naturally, because sometimes I can just be walking around in my own little bubble, uh, not really thinking like what's going on in other people's lives. And, and I don't mean that to sound so selfish, but um, it's, it's made me think about how actually towards my church family, but also my neighbours as well, because we got to know them a little bit better, mm -hmm. and I just want to show a little bit more hospitality. Um, I recently bought a book called Her Boys Table, haven't read it yet, but you know, bought it. And it's just about the idea of hospitality and just and just being present with people, and I think that's really people got to show me. Okay, good. Last question then. Um, we're meeting together today as your church family. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 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 Well, obviously not that amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time we've been here for sixty odd weeks. Come on. Um, what's the biggest thing that you've missed about being together as a church family? Together in the you know together together. I mean. Um, you know, I know we can't really sing the same way we can, like, you know, it's like humming going to my mask, like, you know, along to the tune, but, um, but being able to worship, being able to sort of read the Bible together and, and just be present with one another is, because of course for the past over a year now we've been doing all these things in isolation, sort of looking at a screen and doing these things, if we've been able to actually be online at all, we wouldn't have, so I think just being together to worship is, yeah, and it, Okay, thanks very much indeed, Naomi. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavour. I might be um, tapping someone else on the shoulder in a few weeks to ask you some more questions. Not necessarily about lockdown, but you never know. Something else might come up and ask you about some different things or whatever. But um, thanks, Naomi, and um, that's really good. And Neil's now gonna, Neil's going to come now and, and pray, and um, I'm sure. We'll be all blessed by that as well. So we'll get over to you. Why isn't anyone else? It's a bit emotional being back today. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for this morning today. That it feels like yesterday that we were in here, not the, the 60 weeks or so, like Andy said. But Lord, let, let's not let the 60 weeks go past by without a notice. Help us to examine our hearts and what we've learned about ourselves and about you in this time. What we've needed to do less of and what we've needed to do more of. How much more we need grace and patience and joy. And sometimes that we need to seek that out. Well, thank you for what Naomi shared. And I do thank you just for the act of love that the church has shown by supporting each other in, the, in these difficult times. <coughs> For the Pritchards and just the example that they've set in doing that more. We thank you, Lord, for that we were able to worship together this morning. And not just because we can't do it as we would do previously, Lord, the, the, the words that echo me no, are no less greater to you in our worship. Lord, but we may be frustrated by the way that things are. Help our hearts to be in the right place that sing out to you. Father, we pray for the children going out this morning, for their leaders, and just for the blessing and privilege that it's been to, to disciple our own children at home, realising, Lord, that it's, it is our duty, it is our responsibility, but it is also an, an immense privilege, even when it's hard. Thank you, Lord, for the last year and a half for the lights that you've shone in our dark places things that you've shown that we need to stop and the things that you've shown us that we need to do more of it. And the fact, Lord, that you've said to us the whole time, I'm not going anywhere. You are no in way, shape or form absent, Lord, in the last year and a half. If anything, Lord, our, apparent, our need for you was more apparent than ever. I pray for Paul as he brings his message this morning, that we may have hearts and ears that want to hear to apply it in our week. 
and Lord, that ultimately, Lord, that just because we can't do things as we would have done normally, Lord, that we will still want to take your message of love, unconditional, of grace, of freedom, and Lord, that we are broken and that we need a saviour, that we can do that within our community. Lord, we've seen again and again and again this last year that we shouldn't be looking to the things of the world for security, to bring us hope, to bring us peace. We need to be constantly looking to you. And I pray that this morning as we go out, Lord, it'll be such a nice thing to realise that we can be back together, but it's not church that we're here for, Lord, it's you that we're here for. Let, they, let that be what resonates in our bones this morning, Lord. I just pray ahead of our, each and every one of our weeks for whatever we have coming up, whatever we have worried about, whatever we're looking forward to, whatever we really don't want to do. Lord, that we can do so knowing that you've gone ahead of us and that we can call on, the, on you, you who cast the stars into the skies, who is infinitely more capable than we can even imagine. And we get to ask you for help, for support, for love, for wisdom and guidance. Thank you for this time that we've had together this morning, Lord, that we will share ongoing. We ask, Lord, that in your ultimate power, that you keep the rain from the skies for us this afternoon. Pray this in your heavenly and awesome name. Amen.
to us as, as we begin and go on over the next seven weeks. Uh, we're going to be reading in a moment the first two chapters and before we do that I'd like to set the book in, in some context. Now our, our timeline up here is helpful but I know in a sense it's, it's a bit small for everybody to see but you might like to come and have a glance at it afterwards. So let's go back to David, David the great king. And after David, his son Solomon. Solomon very wise, but made foolish decisions as well. But after Solomon came his son Rehoboam. And during the reign of Rehoboam, the nation of Israel divided into two groups. And he had ten tribes in the north, which became known as Israel. And in the south, you had two tribes known as Judah. How sad that God's people were divided. And God had warned his people through his prophets they must remain faithful to him. They must remain true to him. And when they're in this land, they must not follow the other nations. They must not intermarry. They must be God's holy, set-apart people that bring him glory. That tell to the nations of the world that Yahweh is great. And then they must come and worship and seek him. But God's people did not obey the Lord. They were not faithful. And through his prophets, God had promised that if they disobeyed, he would send other nations. The nations that they were supposed to display God's glory to and to say God is great, God would actually raise up those nations and bring them against God's people. To use them in judgment and correction upon his people. Do you remember when we were in the book of Daniel? And it was the Babylonians that came and took Daniel and the cream of the crop into Babylon. That was the group in the south, Judah, that came, that were attacked. Prior to that, it was the Assyrians. We got that up on our, our wall here. The Assyrians that came and attacked the northern kingdom and took people off to Assyria. So we had the Assyrians first, then the Babylonians were raised up and became the superpower. And God's people not only first divided, but now God's people are separated. That's been us, isn't it, over the past year plus, separated. I trust that's not been because of God's judgment upon us. But nevertheless, we confess that God is always in control. Even when we don't understand it, God is always in control. He's always working out his purposes. And COVID hasn't won the victory over God's sovereignty and kingship over all history. Remember, look up here, we've got history is his Story. God is writing the history of mankind and of your individual lives every day. In fact, he's written it in the past before one of your days came to be. God is in control. It's his kingdom. We are God's people in God's place under God's rule. Now, the cream of the crop had been taken off to another land. Imagine if Germany had been successful in World War II and our soldiers and our government and our most educated people were all taken to Germany and used to build the empire of Germany. And all that was left in the UK were the consequences of the Blitz 
Imagine if even Buckingham Palace had been destroyed and its walls broken down, left in ruins. And all that was left in the UK were the poor. And that that happened, that situation remained for 50 to 70 years. So during this time, the people in Babylon had not been around the temple. They'd not been together. They'd not had the priests operating sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins, the worship together. And whilst the people, the cream, were in Babylon, the Jews in Babylon, they'd had children. A whole generation had risen up that hadn't known life in Jerusalem, that hadn't known worship at the temple for decades. Now there was a return. God promised, as well as promising that he would bring judgment upon his people for unfaithfulness, God in his grace had said, when you return to me, I will bring you back. I will never completely leave you and forsake you. I will gather you again. And just like we've had different waves of coronavirus, there were different waves of return to Judah, Jerusalem. The first wave came when the next superpower arose. So we had Assyria first, then Babylon. Who could tell me the third superpower that arose? Persians, well done. And king of Persia was Cyrus. And when Cyrus became king, he granted that the Jews could return. Quite amazing, really. You see, one of the, one of the ways, the reasons for exile happening was that superpowers would say, if we leave people together, they might fight against us. But if we separate them, if we take off the good ones and use them for our kingdom, and leave the poor in this dilapidated city, they'll be weak. But Cyrus said, we can return. That was, that was God's work again, isn't it? God's sovereignty. And so, under a man called Zerubbabel, he was the grandson of the last king of Judah, the first wave of exiles returned to their homeland. Imagine the rejoicing a bit like us today. And thousands returned, maybe many who had never lived in Jerusalem. That was the first wave. That was in 516 BC. No, it wasn't. Forget it. 516 BC is a key date because that's when the temple was rebuilt. Okay? So the temple had been destroyed. Solomon's great temple, and in 516, that 70 years after it was destroyed, and God had promised that the people would be in exile for 70 years, 70 years later, the temple was rebuilt. It took about 20 years to rebuild it, okay? So that was the, the first wave was under Zerubbabel, and you can read those in the first six chapters of Ezra. That's the history in Ezra. Zerubbabel had the temple rebuilt. Then, after the rebuilding of the temple, we go on another 50 years before the next wave of returnees to Jerusalem. And that was under Ezra. Ezra was a priest. And Ezra came to teach God's people the law. Now, can you see the significance, the importance of that? God's people used to worship and be taught in the temple. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. People divided, separated. Imagine you being away from church, not just for 15, 16 months, but for 50, 60, 70 years. And we'd come back and my Joshua not only would be as tall as me, but he'd be greyer than me. <laughs> he'd, be, he'd, be, he'd be wrinklier than me. <laughs> and many of you would no longer be here. 50, 
60, 70 years. Away from the temple, away from teaching. Now, no doubt in Babylon, just like we've been trying to engage with church over our lockdowns. We've been trying to do online if we've got the facilities. People in Babylon would have been trying, no doubt, to still worship Yahweh. But like us, it wouldn't have been the same, would it? They didn't have the temple. They were away from their homeland. And no doubt, during that period, many of the Jews became more like Babylonians than they did Jews. Many of the Jews would have begun to follow the idols of the nations. And many of the, the remnant that were left back in Jerusalem, they too would have grown cold, half-hearted. And they began, we know from Scripture, that they began to intermarry with other nations that lived around and people that began to move into Jerusalem because the Jews weren't there. So it's a very hard time for God's people, but it was God's judgment upon them. So when Ezra comes back, he says, look, let's remember the law of God. Let me remind you of God's ordinances. Let me remind you of what God gave to Moses. These are the word of God that we must base live our lives upon and he drew God's people back to the word of God that was the second wave and the third wave is what we're going to be looking at and then Nehemiah Nehemiah comes 13 years after Ezra has been teaching the law of God in Jerusalem now let's turn to God's word and read it and see about this man, Nehemiah, and how he came to return to Jerusalem. So Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, that's in Babylon, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who, who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are, un are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commandments, then, even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayers of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success 
Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. And in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This could be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been burnt, destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates, so that I will provide so that they will provide me with safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governor of the Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officials and cavalry with me. When Sambalat and Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the well-being of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem. And after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no, no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved towards the foundation gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mate to get through. So I went up the valley by, the, by night, examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. Because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, 
you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. just want to bring out a few key things from those first chapters. And the first is Nehemiah's godly concern for his people and God's glory. Nehemiah's godly concern for his people and God's glory. <coughs> Nehemiah probably had been born in Babylon, never seen the temple, and yet he'd heard this report now from a brother who comes back, that even these 70 odd years since the temple had been rebuilt, that still the walls were broken down and the gates burned with fire since when the Babylonians first entered and destroyed it. Imagine that if the Germans had invaded us, Buckingham Palace had left, been left in ruins and yet the first returnees had been able to rebuild the palace and yet still the gates and the walls around the palace were still in ruins and hadn't been rebuilt. And still the windows and the doors were smashed, totally insecure. And the nations around me said, look, look at the UK, they're still in the shambles, they're still totally weak, still open to attack. And yet God's people and God's land and Jerusalem and the temple were supposed to display God's glory and Nehemiah just knows this is not right. God's people are still a disgrace rather than a glory to the nations. He has a heart to make it better. Do we have that heart? As we look at our church, as we look about the state of the UK, as we look to the nations of the world, what's on our heart? Are we satisfied? with the way things are. I imagine a lot of people in Jerusalem had just been happy that the gates were down and the walls were down. Over those decades, they could have done something about it. But God laid it upon Nehemiah's heart and he would go back and he would encourage the people. You know, there are ways that we can fuel our heart for a passion for God's glory and for the church. I've got some packs of cards here. I've got two that the FIEC produced. There's 50 places in the UK that need a church to be planted where there's not really a gospel witness. And you can take one card a day and pray for that place, that God would raise up a church in that place. Or you can take Operation World and gain a pray for a country each day of the year, or go on to the Joshua Project and pray for an unreached people group a day. Just ways that you can fuel your heart with a desire to see God glorified in the world. So Nehemiah had that godly concern. God placed it upon his heart. Secondly, what did Nehemiah do with that information? Did he pack his bag straight away? Give up, give up his job. Say, sorry, king, I can't be your cupbearer anymore. I'm off to Jerusalem. No. He didn't jump into action. What did he do first? He prayed. We can all do that, can't we? We can all pray. He fasted and prayed. He mourned. So much was it on his heart that he was in a sense of mourning, as if somebody had died. God's, God's glory is dying. God's people are dying. It's not right. And he turned it into prayer. Now look who he prayed to. Four times in what we've read, he refers to God as the God of heaven. He knows that if he's going to do anything about this, it's not Nehemiah's strength. But it'll be done in the power and the strength of the God of heaven. Folks, the 
the building up of the church, the reaching of our community with the good news of Jesus, seeing churches planted in a nation that's going after materialism and rejecting God, and reaching nations of the world that still know nothing about Jesus is a huge task that we cannot do in our own strength. We cannot, but we turn to the God of heaven. We turn to the God who reigns over history. We turn to the God who is limitless in power and we pray. And we pray according to his promises. That's what Nehemiah did. He said, Lord, remember the promises that you gave to Moses. Lord, remember your word. You're true to your word. And I'm trusting in your promises and I'm trusting in your power. So if you ever know, struggle to know what to pray for, turn to God's word. Find his promises. Say, Lord, Jesus, you've promised to build your church. God, you sent the Lord Jesus because you so love the world. Father, we know that the harvest is ripe. You've told us that. But the workers are free of you. And we're praying for workers for the harvest. So we pray. But then we act. Nehemiah didn't stop with praying. He turned to faithful action. Even though he's in fear of his life. Imagine this. You have a privileged responsibility for the king of the superpower, the Persian Empire. He's a cupbearer. That doesn't mean he just takes, you know, he's like a glorified servant. Here, king, here's your wine. The cupbearer had a very, very privileged place. He was more like a confidant. He would be with the quick king frequently throughout the day. And the king would use him as a signing board, maybe, maybe as an advisor. And yet he's going to go to the king and say, King, I want to leave your service and I want to leave Persia. The king of an empire would likely have somebody's head for that kind of insolence. But the king notices that so, um, Nehemiah is different. He looks physically well, but he can tell it by his uh, demeanor that he's sad. He's got a sadness of heart. And he asks him what the matter is. And Nehemiah says, and he explains, and the king says, what do you want? And he says, not only does he say, can, can I leave your service? He says, and, and while you're at it, can you write me a letter so that I'm safe as I travel from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem? Because no doubt there's, a, there's danger en route. And, and as well as that, I want you to pay for the restoration of the walls of Jerusalem and the gates and the house that I'm going to live in while I'm there. Can you give me a letter so that I can have as much timber as I need from your royal park? And the king says, yeah, of course. Let me get out my checkbook. It's nothing other than the sovereignty of God working in Nehemiah's life and in the king's life. And we must trust that, mustn't we? God can be at work in Joe Biden's life. Joe can be at work in Kim Jong-un's life. And Angela Merkel's life. And Boris Johnson's life. They're not more powerful than God. And the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. It's all his. All the empires of the world. All the nations of the world. All the wealth of the nations belongs to God. And if we pray, and if we have a passion and a heart for the glory of God, and if we act faithfully with whatever God lays upon our hearts, God can provide. God can lead. God will bless and God will use us for his own glory. Another say in finishing that Nehemiah is probably the last bit of kind of narrative history that we've got in the Old Testament. Some of the prophets speak into the situation, the prophets towards the end of our Old Testament 
But after this, we hear nothing for 400 years until the coming of the God of heaven. The God of heaven who steps into this broken world, not to build a physical temple and a physical wall, not to establish Israel, but to be the God of heaven who wants to live in this temple. And this temple, these spiritual stones that are going to be built together to be a glorifying place in which God lives by his spirit. And through you and through Good News Church and Christians and churches around the world, we don't tell people to come to us. Not to come into this building and to come into this nation, but we go into the nation with Jesus Christ and we say he came and he wants you to come to him and he's going to build his kingdom in this world for the glory of God. Thanks be to God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for his greatness, his sovereignty and that he's going to work even through you, me, this church as he reestablishes us, as he builds us up again for his glory. We're going to sing about the God of heaven living in me and pray that God would use us for his name's sake. Theoretically, we are at the end of our service. 
we don't have to stop worshipping God, do we? When we were thinking about songs for this week, one of the songs which came to mind was Cornerstone. And I think it's so appropriate that we should sing that now. On Christ alone, our cornerstone. No other foundation can we build upon. No philosophy, nor the wisdom of men. All other ground is sinking sand. Oh, we managed to uh, pull the words down for that. Sorry, I know it was a bit, what well, is a bit short notice. We're, we're, we're trying out some new music software as well today, so it's all new. I'll give him another minute. Upon this rock, you build your church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. When we blind, when we bind and loose, we proclaim the truth. In Jesus' name, we will not fail. He's building his church. Should we sing for him? Should we sing for him? Girls are going to sing in other words.
stood here. The verse of the day is just popped up on my Bible, on my, on my phone. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of this time now, we just thank you so much for the fact that we've been able to come together to worship you today. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us. Thank you for letting us worship you this morning. And Lord, as we as we now go from here, we know we can rest assured that you are indeed our cornerstone, our rock, the centre of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us, Lord, as we go into this week, not to forget that, but to keep that close in our hearts. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for all those that have been able to gather with us this morning, both in this building and, Lord, through the wonders of the internet. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our young people. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Give us a, a great time, Lord, as we now go to Page Park and some of us uh, just get together for a picnic lunch. Pray, Lord, for our conversations and pray, Lord, for that time together now this afternoon. And as we go away from this place, keep us safe, keep us close to you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you.